Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seventh and final day of the Chainmakers Academic Bootcamp 2021. It's been an incredible journey with some great professors and researchers from UQ sharing their experiences and knowledge and imparting valuable learnings in these programs. I'm also grateful to all the participants who have shown immense engagement and commitment to learning and acknowledge the need to equip themselves with the future skills to prepare themselves for tomorrow, the theme of the event. You are the chain leaders, and we are proud to help you in every way we can. On these lines, I commit that we would put together another learning program very soon and help you succeed in life through learning and support. My name is Amit Upadhyay, and I'm your host for the day. Hope you are doing well following all the safety guidelines that the government has issued and keeping safe in the current times. We welcome you to the session and thank you for taking out the time and attending this program today. The program is a deep engagement with some of the most senior professors and researchers at UQ. The aim is to think about how we can contribute individually and become part of the solution for the global challenges we are facing in the present world to equip us with some of the future skills required to do so. Now, before we start, let me do a quick round of introduction for of Pearson and UQ. Pearson is the world's leading learning company with 40,000 employees in more than 80 countries working to help people of all ages to make measurable progress in their lives through learning. We provide learning materials, technologies, assessments, and services to teachers and students in order to help people everywhere aim higher and fulfill their true potential. We put the learner at the center of everything we do. Now a bit about UQ. For more than a century, the University of Queensland has maintained a global reputation for creating positive change by delivering knowledge leadership for a better world. UQ ranks amongst the world's top universities as measured by several key independent rankings. UQ is the second top ranked university in Australia and ranked 36th by the US News Best Global University Rankings. With a strong focus on teaching excellence, having won more national teaching awards than any other Australian university, UQ is committed to providing students with the best opportunities and practical experiences during their time with us, empowering them with transferable knowledge and skills that will prepare them to exceed expectations throughout their careers. UQ is one of the only three Australian members of the Global Universitas 21, a founding member of the Group of Eight Universities, a member of Universities Australia, and one of the only three Australian charter members of the prestigious edX consortium, the world's leading not-for-profit consortium of massive open online courses. And now, let me introduce you to the most important guests for the day. Dr. Lisette is a lecturer in biotechnology within the School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences at UQ. Her teaching and research focuses on innovation and commercialization within the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries. This context is particularly interesting given the recent advances in genomic sciences, precision medicines, and digital health that are disrupting the, the industry. He, uh, she holds a Bachelor of Biotechnology, Masters of Technology, and Innovation and Management, and PhD in Business from UQ. Professor Avril Robertson is the Director of Biotechnology Program and Professor of Biotechnology within the School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences at UQ. Her teaching and research focuses on biotechnology and medicinal chemistry, specifically the discovery and development of novel drugs. She holds a Bachelor of Science and a PhD in Chemistry from the University of St. Andrews. Now, today's topic is how science can change the world. Uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to hand over the stage to our professors, Dr. Lizette and Professor Avril. Uh, please note that we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the academic capsule. So please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A section, and we'll try and seek answers to them. Now, before I hand over the stage to the professors, I'll run a short poll, uh, which should be on your screen right now. And I would request you to uh, you know, participate in the polling so that we can give uh, Dr. Lisette and Professor Avril an idea of where you are from. Uh, over to you. Please uh, start polling. So Dr. Lisette uh, and Professor Avril, we would have the results of the polling on your screens right now. Uh, you see there are a lot of students from the science background. Uh, it's hovering in the 60s. Uh, we've got some students from uh, the IT background, some 8 to 10% of them. 
commerce some 12 to 13 and arts and humanities some 11 to 12 percent but mostly the students today are from the science background mm -hmm. and uh in terms of being familiar with the topic being covered today uh some 50 percent uh students are in one way or the other familiar with the topic uh eight percent have no idea at all and then uh, a good 45 percent students would like to know more so that's uh you know that's the audience for you over to you now. Thank you so much. We are very excited to have you and look forward to a great session. That's a great start, Amit. Thank you so much for your introduction. And it's very interesting to see the polling results. So as um, Dr. Amit has said, I'm Director of Biotechnology here at the University of Queensland. And I spent, before I came to the University of Queensland, around 10 years in industry. And one of the key parts of biotechnology is the crossover between science and commercial world. And Lizette is very familiar with the other side of that <laughs> spectrum. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to be talking to you. As Avril said, I work with, we work together in the biotechnology program here at UQ. And uh, my background is in biotechnology. So I actually studied biotech here at UQ. And um, I was actually mentioning to Avril earlier how I was reflecting back about my decision making and thought process when I was in high school and trying to think about what I wanted to study when I finished high school. And I loved chemistry and I loved biology. And so for me, thinking about biotechnology seemed like a natural fit um, as well. At the time, they had just finished sequencing the human genome and the first draft sequence had just been released. So it was a really exciting time to be involved in in biotechnology, in science, and seeing even all the way back then how understanding what our genetic sequence is and how that has in the last 20 so years since I've graduated, how just that knowledge alone, how much that's changed the world that we currently live in. Um, and as Avril mentioned, I now focus on more of the commercial mm -hmm. side of the industry and how these amazing discoveries and new knowledge can be commercialized and taken to market to really have an impact on, on us, on the environment, on patients. Yeah. I think um, it's very interesting to look back on the human, human genome sequencing and think how long it took. And now you can send a sample in the post to somewhere, some lab in the world and find out all about your own genetics. Yeah, it's, it's so incredible how I think back 20 years ago, it took them maybe three or four years to sequence mm. our genome. And now there's machines that can do it in a couple of hours. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, so science really has changed the world. Um, so we're gonna focus today, because science is really broad. Um, we're gonna focus on, more specifically on biotechnology. So more of the biological and chemical processes um, underpinning science. But before we get started, I just wanted to understand from you guys, what do you think biotechnology is? And so we're going to ask you if you can pull up your smartphones or if you're on a computer and you can pop this um, address in that should be flashing up on your screen in a moment um, to open up a- Share that screen. No, I think that one should. Um, if you can open that link and start typing in some keywords that come to mind when you think of what is biotechnology? Let's see, thank you for letting us know you can see it. And as you type those keywords in, a word cloud will appear here and we'll be able to see in real time what you guys think of when the word biotech comes to mind. Groundbreaking research, that's something we're very famous for over here. We're number seven in the world. Wow, look at these, <laughs> these are great. Life-changing, it certainly is. Yes, amazing, I like that. Improving health, definitely. That's one part of biotech. That's the part I'm most interested in, actually. <laughs> There's got to be some more out there. There's some coming through the chat as well. Oh, wow. Better plants. Career of the really future. It certainly is. In the chat, we've got use of biological sciences in industries or can say use of bacteria in industries. That's one of them, yep. Latest technology in the field of biotech. So technology would be certainly a key word there. Yeah. So you don't have to fill in all of the 
um, keyword options on that link. You can just submit as, as, as many or as few as you'd like. Oh, here we go. That's great. Tool for mass control. <laughs> <laughs> Molecular study, that's very accurate. DNA, oh, yep, that's CRISPR. probably the cornerstone. CRISPR, that's an excellent one. Biohacking, futuristic. DNA. We have some great ones there. Yeah. Science and technology together. Just give you give you a few more minutes in case there's some other people still submitting their keywords. And we will do this again at the end. So we'll see how your perception changes, X-Men. <laughs> Superhumans. Cures to disease, that's excellent. Improving genes, yes. Okay. Okay. Let's... Oh, there's more coming through. This is fantastic. And they're all very different. Playing Mutation. with genes. <laughs> okay. So it's really interesting to see and learn about your perspectives about what is biotechnology. So now let's have a look at some of the more official definitions and see how close or how different um, your impressions were. So if we have a look at the definition of biotechnology from a company called Bio, which is one of the major um, biotech biology industry organizations globally, at its simplest, Biotechnology is technology based on biology. Biotechnology harnesses cellular and biomolecular processes to develop technologies and products that help improve our lives and the health of our planet. So not too dissimilar to some of the keywords that you were mentioning before. We can also see based on the OECD definition that biotechnology is defined as the application of science and technology to living organisms, as well as parts, products, and models thereof, to alter living or non-living materials, with the production of knowledge, goods, and services. I like these two definitions because they both highlight similar aspects, which is really important. Um, and we can pull out keywords from these definitions to really focus and hi highlight that biotechnology at its most fundamental is about cellular and biomolecular processes applied for goods and services. And it's these goods and services that have the potential to change the world. And there's many different ways that these potential goods and services and the application of cellular and biomolecular processes can change, have and can change and drive the future. So there's three main areas of biotech that we think about. First is around human health. And so biotechnology and, and science in general can really drive the future and change the world in terms of pharmaceutical drug discovery and production, pharmacogenomics, so looking at how our genes and our biochemical processes and new um, and drugs um, interact within our body, as well as genetic testing and screening. We can also think about it in terms of how our agricultural industry and how biotechnology and science can help drive the future in agriculture. And that's through the development of sustainable agriculture, biofuels, bioremediation technology. And then there's also the industrial space. So in this area, biotechnology and science can really help drive the future in terms of treatment of wastewater, microbial production and sustainable chemical production. And there's a few examples here on the screen that we'll talk through in more detail as we, as we work through the, the webinar. But these are really great examples of science and technology products and goods and services that have been driving the future. So here we've got a picture of sugarcane and sugarcane's being grown around the world and being harvested for its cellulosic content, but also its sugar content. And that sugar content can be used to make biofuels. We've also got examples of two drugs here, one Opdivo, one Spinraza, 
And these are really great examples of cutting edge pharmaceutical drugs and new medicines that are targeted to people based on their own genetic and gene mutation. So we see here uh, nivolumab, which is the, the generic name. It's an antibody that's used to treat cancer patients. And it was initially dis, uh, developed and approved to treat melanoma patients that have a particular mutation. Um, and that particular mutation meant that they were resistant or, or weren't responding to other medicines that were already available to treat cancer. Um, and so it was a really groundbreaking medicine. And, it's, and actually now this, this drug has been approved to treat a whole range of different cancers. So it's a really interesting example of what we would call a precision medicine. This other drug that I wanted to specifically mention, um, trade name Spinraza, is um, it's a, a, I guess you could think about it as almost a gene therapy type technology. Um, and it's treating patients that have spinal muscular atrophy. And 20 years ago, when the human genome was first being mapped, these drugs were science fiction. They're just you know, a figment of the future. Mm -hmm. we, we were hoping that this would be possible. And it's really interesting um, to see that it's actually become a reality. Um, and for those of you who are curious, yes, that is a picture of me back in the lab. So this was me when I was doing research in my honours year at the end of my biotechnology studies. So it's a while ago, but it's nice to see that um, a lot of the techniques that I was using then are still being used in the lab today. But let's take a step back from, for a minute because it's Biotechnology hasn't, isn't just changing the world now. Biotechnology has been changing the world for 10,000 plus years. Um, it's been around for centuries, a millennia even. Um, some of the most basic examples and well um, historic examples of biotechnology being used for goods and services is in the production of cheese, wine, bread, beer, these are all uh, food products that rely on um, biomolecular processes and, and organisms to help produce those, those foodstuffs. Um, all these products use microorganisms um, to help uh, either ferment or in the aging process. Um, and so if we think back to that original keywords that we pulled out of the bio and OECD, OECD definitions of biotechnology, we can see that even 10,000 years ago, cellular and biomolecular processes were being applied for goods and services. Um, and so we just wanted to um, also think about not just how biotechnology has been used for millennia um, in terms of making food products that we know like beer and cheese, but um, how over hundreds and thousands of years we've been using other less known methods um, that are part of biotechnology to help um, improve um, natural food products, natural fruit and vegetables that we eat. Um, so this is a process that we would call selective breeding. And this is where farmers would uh, select seeds from one of their crops, um, seeds from a plant that displayed some type of really um, valuable characteristic it might be color, it might be larger fruit, it could be um, better resistant to pests in the field, they could grow quicker, could be tastier. Um, and then they select those seeds and plant those out in the next planting cycle. And then they repeat that process over and over again. And so then over many, many planting generations and potentially hundreds of years, particularly desirable characteristics or what we would call traits start to emerge in our crop species. But over time, this has meant that some of the fruits, vegetables that we eat today, we know very well today, they look very different hundreds or thousands of years ago. So just like to um, open in the chat, um, if you guys could pop in the chat, what fruit or vegetable do you think this is? Tomato. So most of you are saying tomato. It does look like a tomato, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> that was my first guess as well. If we tell Cherry you it's, tomato, it's, not, it's not a tomato. Not a tomato. 
It's not a raspberry. I'll give, we'll give you another hint. It's not even the same color today as it was back then. Peach? I think it's used quite a lot in Indian cooking, actually. I think so too. Eggplant. Eggplant. Yes. Anushka, got you got it. <laughs> this well done. This is the uh, original eggplant. So some people might even call it an heirloom eggplant species. Mm -hmm. And you can see now that uh, eggplant today looks very different to what it did back uh, when this picture was um, or before they started, before farmers started selectively breeding mm -hmm. the eggplants. All right, we've got a few more quizzes for you along this line. What fruit or vegetable do you think this is? Lotus fruit, not a good guess. I can see why you think that. Papaya? Ladyfinger banana. Banana, yes. yes, you got it. So this is now, when PowerPoint works, banana. All right, one more. What about this? Yeah, yeah, they've got it. Maize, corn. So it's really interesting how over many different generations of fruit and vegetables, we can selectively breed or choose out desirable traits that we would like. And this is a form of science and biotechnology changing the world um, for better, hopefully, in terms of more nutritious food. But there's other interesting examples, particularly from uh, agriculture, where selective breeding has been used, um, not just to change the way one species looks, but to change the way one species can look in many different ways. So this is a wild mustard plant. And this wild mustard plant over generations has been selectively breed, bred um, to produce a whole bunch of different types of vegetables that we eat today. So I don't know if you're all aware, um, but cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and kale and Brussels sprouts as well, although they're not on this picture, are all from, originally from the same species of brassica, which is this wild mustard plant. Um, and Avril, there's yeah. another story around this wild mustard plant that's really interesting. Yeah, this whole class of vegetables are known as superfoods. And I actually did my PhD on these um, plants many years ago. And in these plants, there are molecules called isothiocyanates, leucosinolates. And these exist in the plant naturally. So if the plant is damaged, then maybe it could be an insect eating it or a, a rabbit is eating the leaves. What the plant can do is make even more of these compounds and it makes these molecules, these plants taste a little bit bitter. Uh, another one is um, rocket. You may come across rocket and it's very peppery. Most of these plants taste a bit peppery and that's because of those molecules. They're in the, mall, in the plant to protect the plant, but some insects have adapted to become used to these molecules. And they, what they do is they detect these molecules in the receptors on their feet. And when they detect the right kind of molecules in the plant, what they can do is use that protection of the plant to protect their own offspring. So what they do is they run down the plant, they plant their eggs in the soil, their eggs hatch and their larvae can eat the plant. So it's a natural source of food, they have no predators, and it's a good way to survive. But that's really clever um, in other ways as well, because when we eat these plants, they're actually anti-cancer. So those same molecules that protect the plant can also protect us from um, certain cancers. So it's more than one system all in one plant. Beyond that, these plants are even more useful because they can be used in bioremediation. So you may have soils which have been contaminated through waste metals, for example. These plants are very good at accumulating those metals up from the soil and decontaminating the soil. So one small example has many, many aspects of biotechnology within it. Yeah, it's really fascinating. So, 
Um, and there are examples like this throughout the all of biotech and lots of science as well. One plant that has had multiple uses in many different ways. Um, um, and we mentioned before that brewing is a, an example of biotechnology. So, you know, what we, what do our parents drink? Um, you know, there's, there's a, at, at its heart is an enzymatic conversion process using yeast. And this um, picture on the left here is one of the earliest examples of um, a recipe for beer. And I, I think this was discovered six or 7,000 years ago. So yeah, it's really such a rich history of um, organisms and, and cellular processes and microorganisms that are being used in so many different ways for so many years to really change um, society and, and um, the world. But if we now think about um, more looking towards the future, so biotechnology is not just about all of these ancient processes. Um, there's so much happening now that's really helping to change the world now and in the future. And we can use science to produce products or solve problems that are valuable to society now and in the future. So just a quick um, question for everyone. Who has, why isn't this working? Sorry about that. Who here has had a COVID test? So my son had one. I've had one. <laughs> wasn't particularly wasn't particularly fun. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I'm really, um, I guess, uh, respectful about the COVID test is that I feel like it's really increased our awareness of some of the fundamental um, biotechnology and cutting edge science techniques that are being used to analyze whether we have or hadn't. Mm -hmm. Um, the virus present. And one of those is PCR, which is um, um, a technique or a technology that's fundamental to a lot of science, biotechnology and molecular biology these days. So for those of you who don't know exactly what PCR is, it's a process where we take double-stranded DNA that's occurring naturally in, out of cell, cell samples or human tissue samples or plant samples or animal samples. And when we heat up the DNA, the double strands separate. And then when we cool it down, they come back together again. And by including um, other enzymes and um, little pieces of individual pieces of DNA, the nucleic acids in that test tube, this heating and cooling process means that we can make many, many copies of that DNA fragment over cycles of heating and cooling. And so this is the fundamental process of um, one of the more, more well widely used COVID tests. Um, and I also think it's a really interesting uh, process because it, it also it highlights to me how scientists who discovered um, this PCR process really were thinking outside the box when it came to how we can make this process work. Because the heating and cooling um, of the uh, involved in separating and, and annealing back the strands of DNA, um, the temperatures are usually or are too high for the enzymes that we need to function. They become denatured and they break down at these high temperatures. And so the scientists that were developing this thought, well, where can we go? Where can we find an enzyme that um, will still work properly at that high temperature? And they thought, well, Let's think about the natural world. Whereabouts do we have naturally occurring cells that thrive in high temperatures? And so they actually, I believe that they were working in around the California Silicon Valley area. And so they went and looked and got some um, bacteria from the hot geysers in Yellowstone National Park. And they took the enzyme out of those naturally occurring bacteria and they used that in the PCR process. And now the, the enzyme used is called TAC polymerase and TAC means it's from the bacteria Thermus aquaticus, which is the bacteria that um, survives naturally and thrives in these really hot geysers. And I just think it's a wonderful example of something from nature being adapted to help us with our molecular biology and our biotechnology techniques 
and how something as simple as taking an enzyme from a naturally occurring bacteria has really helped us now. So they um, found this enzyme and discovered this process back in the early 80s. And now it's having such a big impact on us and our COVID testing. So hopefully what you're gathering from what we've been saying so far is that there's such a diversity in biotechnology and how it can be applied to help change the world. Um, and we can drill down into some of these different areas in more detail. So we can think about biotechnology around biopharmaceuticals. So this is the medical field where we think about discovering new drugs and vaccine, vaccines, diagnostic tests, tackling diseases that have no current treatment, there's an unmet medical need, people are suffering from a particular disease. Through biotechnology and development of biopharmaceuticals, we can really um, help change the world. We can also think about bioagriculture. So how are we Oh, wrong, sorry, bioservices, wrong order. <laughs> so in bioservices, we can think about um, the services that we can use. So not so things like manufacturing, um, not just the discovery process, but um, how do we manufacture new drugs? Um, how do we um, help fund this research? Um, what are all the other um, ad adjunct or ancillary services around legal around uh, business management that are really important to help manage this entire process. Also things yeah. like companies which do the PCR, yep. PCR to other genetic testing. Yeah. So sequence your own genomes. That's yep. an example of a bioservice. So they just pick one aspect of um, biotechnology and they specialize in it. Yeah. And that is a service to the world really in looking at your genes in terms of many diseases that you may harbor in your gen in your genes or just for curiosity's sake in knowing your ancestry and tracking that back so there can be many reasons to look at your genome yeah like all that ancestry.com mm -hmm. dna sequencing um, we've also got bioagriculture so this is where we focus on how we might feed the world in the future and what novel crops or how do we improve growing of crops how do we grow crops on less water or on land that has less nutrients in the soil. Um, then we've got bioindustrial. So we can think about fermentation technologies, biofuel production, even, but even things like textile production mm -hmm. and how we can do this sustainably. And then bioinformatics. So a mm -hmm. real emerging area or has been emerging and will continue to emerge area of biotechnology is the combination of genetic information and computing power. Mm. And again, over the last 20 years with, with computing power increasing, the area of bioinformatics and doing big data analysis, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning on genetic information is really um, growing at a rapid pace. Mm. And then all of these areas have really exciting employability options. So we're gonna break down these areas for the next few minutes and talk a bit more about all of the really exciting developments in these spaces. But in order to help us understand how all of these, or what all these different areas of biotechnology are, we like to think about biotechnology as a rainbow. And we often talk about the rainbow of biotechnology and classifying in different colors and with different colors representing different areas of biotechnology or different fields of biotechnology. So the three main fields or three main colors in the rainbow that we often refer to is red, green and white. So red, we think of red biotechnology as your medical and health biotechnology, green biotechnology as your agriculture and food biotechnology, and white biotechnology as industrial and now emerging synthetic biology and biotechnology. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the colors in between can represent different areas of biotechnology as well. So some people think about purple biotechnology as the legal aspects and the intellectual property aspects around biotechnology. Um, some people think about yellow as more the food side of biotechnology rather than green. So I'm going to hand over to Avril now and she's going to talk a lot, bit more about medical biotechnology and a lot of the ways that medical biotechnology is helping change the world. Thank you, Lizette. So medical biotechnology is certainly my area of expertise and, and the area I've been interested in all my life, mainly due to ill health myself and everyone has, um, has a story there, I'm sure. So in that red 
field, if you look up the top 10 new medical technologies of, of 2019, CRISPR, it's not, it wasn't really new in 2019, it's been around longer than that, but in using that to edit genes, we can, if you think about it, even edit genes of humans where you may have a human who has a genetically a genetic disease. We have the technology that could cure that. And obviously, as underlies many new technologies, there's a lot of ethics around that. And you will have very strong emotive feelings one way or the other. But how I personally think about it is, is, is that if that was my child, it's a technology I'd want. And if you look back over, as Lizette already mentioned, many years, these biologics therapies that we are now taking advantage of over COVID with the vaccines were outlawed a long, not so long ago. Mm. There was a lot of controversy around them. And right now we really need that technology. So technology moves on. Sometimes things are accepted and sometimes they aren't. For example, GM food in Australia is not accepted at this point in time, but in the future it may be. Similarly, with GM animals and, and all the controversy surrounding that. But CRISPR is really an underlying technology that can edit genes. And we can use that in cell-based systems to understand diseases more. So it's not just about editing genes in whole organisms. It's right down at the cellular, mm. cellular level to help us understand certain processes. Telehealth, you look at digital devices. So you have a huge market in digital devices and medical care through these digital devices. And one of the things that Lizette is very interested in is how do we regulate that? How do we make sure that the information we get from these telehealth sources is right or wrong? And so again, there's questions around that because it's a new emerging technology. Virtual reality, that's awesome. If you're a, if you're a doctor or even if you were starting to drive a car for the first time, Virtual reality is awesome and um, gaming even. So virtual reality, you could imagine as a new doctor actually practicing almost in real time surgery before you go and try it out in a more practical sense. So there's a lot of different aspects to virtual reality that is very exciting. Precision medicine is really hot topic right now. So getting the right treatment for you first time around. So if we know a bit more about our own genetics, we may be able to choose exactly the right drug for you first time around. If you imagine, I mean, infection is everywhere at the moment, but India certainly has its more than its fair share of infectious disease. And often when we go to the doctor with a, uh, bacterial infection, they never really figure out what it is. They just give you an antibiotic. And if it doesn't work, you go back a few weeks later, you get another one and you try that. If we were to sequence that and know which bug it was we had, we would know exactly which drug to use first time. And that is the essence of precision medicine, whether it's cancer, whether it's infectious disease, whatever your particular genetics are determines what treatment you get. And there are some biologic treatments these days which are tremendously expensive because one dose can cure you. And I hope that these biologics ultimately will become cheaper and more widely available across the world because they really are groundbreaking. Health wearables, wearable devices. This is a, an emerging industry that is, is getting bigger and bigger. So. For example, you have an iWatch, something like that. You have an integrated electrocardiogram on your iWatch that can monitor your heart rate and count your steps. These are examples of health wearables. They may even link up to some other app for, developed by a company which can tell you when you're not doing enough exercise, if you've not done enough steps. So these are examples of health wearables. And again, you come back to how do we regulate these new technologies because they are emerging very, very quickly. One thing that's really interesting about the Apple Watch, and I was going to mention it later, but I'll mention it Sorry. now. That's okay. <laughs> it's on topic. Is And this is something that really fascinates me. 
this um, Apple Watch in the US has been cleared as a medical device. Mm. So can you imagine even 10 years ago thinking my watch is now a medical device? It's no longer just a timepiece. I think that's just really fascinating. Someday it's going to connect to your fridge and order your shopping <laughs> and make sure you're eating healthily. I think, I think it already can. <laughs> Artificial organs? We have a great challenge with rejection in organ transplant. These days we can build an organ from your own cells that will never be rejected by your own body. And that again is a tremendously exciting thing for many people across the world. And again, it raises ethical questions for some. 3D printing, implants, joints, sol soluble drugs or pills that contain multiple drugs and can release them at certain time points according to where they are in your body. These are not, these are here now. Wireless brain sensors can dissolve in your brain when they're not needed, but they can detect changes in your brain chemistry and alert you to um, when you may need to take your medication. That's pretty amazing. That's super cool. It is. <laughs> And if you think about surgery, it does not look the same as it used to years ago. You may be a surgeon, but you may be operating a robot to do that surgery with far more precision than you would have if you were to do that manually. And even smart inhalers, Bluetooth enabled to help you manage your condition. So that these are only 10 of a wide variety of new medical technologies that are here today. Well, 2019, so I'm even a year out of date. <laughs> um, so if we look, oh, that one. I'll do it. So we'll look a little bit more detail at personalized medicine. The holy grail is to prevent ever getting disease in the first place. So if you can detect early your risk of getting a particular disease and you may improve your lifestyle or something about your life or even start taking a drug earlier than you normally would, you may prevent getting very severe disease. And that, that is really ideal. But if you do happen to get ill, to be able to diagnose that disease accurately first time is all what personalized medicine is all about. So you understand your genome, you can accurately assess your disease and treat it appropriately. And that will lead to hopefully more effective treatment, shorter duration of illness, whatever that illness is, and a better quality of life. And this is very true, certainly in a number of fields is targeted treatments. We are, especially in the biologic space, increasingly targeting treatments to particular diseases. And as I've said, because of the targeting of these treatments, you, oh, yeah. you may only need one dose of a particular biologic to cure your disease. And one of the things that I've certainly been interested in at the University of Queensland is looking at brain diseases. So particularly Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, motor neuron disease. There's a whole suite of these diseases that essentially at their core, they are destroying the neurons in your brain. And a lot of that process is inflammatory. And one of the challenges for biologics drugs is that they often or well, most cannot enter the brain. So in this space, we need to look a little bit more towards small molecules at the moment to be able to breach that blood brain barrier because your brain's a very protected environment in your head and 98% of all known drugs cannot get into the brain. But we have certainly in the time I've been here, I've developed a molecule that can cross that blood brain barrier. It protects the neurons through reducing drastically the inflammation that's associated with these diseases. And so I did that work and it was commercialized in 2016 to found a company called Inflazome. And just last year that company sold for 600 million to one of the largest biotech companies in the world, which was Roche. And I hope that in the next few years, we'll actually start to see these molecules making a difference in these diseases that are so hard to treat. For example, in Parkinson's disease, you've lost around 80% of your neurons before you even have symptoms. So 
to be able to detect this disease early and treat early will make a big difference for many people across the world. So biotechnology in the medical sense is super exciting. Have I made you think of anything else in the medical biotech space? Is there any questions? I'm going to flip to the Q&A. Yeah, we can. Or the chat. You got any questions so far for me or Lizette? Uh, yes. Uh, would you like to take the questions right now or would you want us to uh, wait for the presentation to be? Okay, well, we'll talk for a few more minutes and yeah. then we'll come back to that. Yeah. Great. Right. Right. So there are other really cool things happening in um, the agricultural biotechnology space as well. So I mentioned before about, or showed a picture before about the Golden Rice Project. I didn't specifically mention it because I wanted to highlight it here, that um, through genetically modifying a strain of rice um, to make it biofortified with vitamin A, this um, golden rice, a genetically modified, modified rice, is being able to help people through consumption of rice get more vitamin A into their bodies. And that's having a big impact on reducing the burden of vitamin A deficiency diseases, um, such as um, blindness and just general developmental issues from lack of vitamins. So by just consuming a food product that you would normally mm. eat anyway, but it's been biofortified with this particular um, vitamin, suddenly has huge health mm. benefits. But another area of biotechnology that's really um, taking off at the moment, and there's a big um, bio um, solar biotechnology research center here at UQ is solar biotechnology, and specifically looking at algae or microalgae um, as one of the um, the organisms of the future. These little little algae, single cell algae um, animals can perform photosynthesis. And so they can actually produce energy. Um, they um, absorb carbon dioxide so that they can be used to help um, reduce some of the carbon dioxide emissions that we would normally have from burning fossil fuels because suddenly we can get our fuels from algae which are producing biofuels. And algae need water to grow. They don't necessarily need to be planted in soil. So there's no reason why we can't have big ponds of algae growing anywhere in the world, really, and not even on the ground. What about a smart city of the future where underneath the, um, the highway or even on top of the highway as part of the um, protection, you've got these big clear glass or probably need to be more um, mm -hmm. uh, um, some type of bioplastic that's mm -hmm. more... Um, uh, stable than glass and having algae growing. And so then the highways themselves are supporting the production of mm. the biofuels that the cars need to drive on them in the first place. I just think that is really fantastic. Mm. But also at the same time as these algae are producing biofuels or energy, they can also be producing other types of proteins that could um, help for food, um, for medicine, so we can have this almost like circular of bioeconomy where we've got these little single cell algae that are producing multiple products, a bit like our um, brassica plant. Yeah. Um, and then probably one of the biggest or most recently um, growing areas of biotech is in what we would call synthetic biology mm. or synthetic biotechnology. So if we think of medical biotechnology as red, and agricultural biotechnology is green, this white industrial and synthetic biology is being heralded as the third wave of biotechnology. And this is happening, so much happening in this space at the moment. Um, and this is an area of biology and science which focuses on the sustainable production or manufacturing of pharma pharmaceuticals, chemicals, food, um, all types of energy. And it's involving engineering these microbial hosts, these algae, these single cell organisms, yeasts, other types of, um, of cellular processes and, and single cell processes um, for metabolic engineering. Um, and this is an area that we would call synthetic biology. It's the fastest growing sector of biotechnology. And just an example um, that uh, bioplastics in terms of bioethylene, and they're expected to account for almost 40% of all the plastic polyethylene production in the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. That's huge to think all of this plastic that we're currently using could one day come 
or be manufactured from a biological system. Mm -hmm. And that means it's also then has a greater chance of being degraded, yes. biodegraded. So we're not pumping petrochemicals into the environment. Um, and we talked a bit before about all the digital transformation mm -hmm. that's happening across mm -hmm. medical biotechnology. And I mentioned the FDA's cleared Apple Watch, but we're also seeing the, all of this age of digital information, machine learning, artificial intelligence impacting even the oldest biotechnology product, which is beer. So there's a couple of companies out there that are using artificial intelligence and machine learning to monitor micronutrients across their batch production of their beer and using that knowledge to improve the efficiency of the beer production. Um, and saving a lot of potential wastage because they now have a much better understanding at the micro level of what's happening in the production. But even just down to bioinformatics, um, as we've mentioned before, there's some fantastic um, internet-based um, technologies and products that you can use to get access to such huge wealth of information at your fingertips. So one that's commonly used in the biotechnology space is this BLAST um, tool, which is actually developed and hosted by the National Library of Medicine and National Institutes of Health in the US. And you can go and search for specific gene sequences mm -hmm. and get an understanding of what we know about all these different genes and how they may be affecting diseases. Um, and then I guess as we kind of come to a close, there's focusing, I guess, on this idea of sustainability for biotechnology. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about improving health making our food more nutritious, but making the world a better place in terms of less pollution, um, less more bioplastics, um, detergents. We can use biotechnology and science to make enzyme, biodetergents and bioenzymes, biofuels, changing the way we culture our meat. I mean, meat production is a very big pollutant globally. And if we can have cultured meats or improve the way we make meat, we produce meat, we can help make the world more sustainable. Um, manufacturing of different flavorings for food, construction materials, biopesticides, biofertilizers, all of these chemicals that traditionally were manufactured using, you know, quite um, industrial scale chemical synthesis processes, which can be quite um, harmful to the environment, we can suddenly start making using biological systems, even down to cosmetics and clothing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware until recently how some of those plant-based natural ingredients, some of the cosmetics that we use, they're hard to come by. And so we might find that there's forests or, or certain areas of agriculture that are being cleared for just these access mm -hmm. to these fine um, chemicals that plants are producing. Um, and so if we can somehow manufacture those using synthetic biology, we can then save having to clear all of that um, agricultural space. And we're seeing this idea about the world becoming more sustainable through biotechnology in this concept of the bioeconomy. Um, and we can see how this bioeconomy, so bio meaning we're using all of the biological processes to help fuel the economic future of, this, of the world and make it a, a more sustainable and more bio-based bio products is just been going and growing so much even in the last 20 years across all of the you know, green, mm -hmm. red, and they've, this graph shows um, industrial as blue, but because it's hard to look at white on yes. white. <laughs> but you can see across all those three areas, there's such growth and there's so much happening in this space. It's really, really exciting. The bioeconomy is essentially just making money out of biotechnology. <laughs> I mean, we are looking at making products to make the world a better place in biotechnology. Um, whether or not you make money out of that product, sometimes you make them for um, the greater good but in many cases you make a lot of money out of some of these products and that underpins the bioeconomy and it has grown exponentially if i look back when i did my degree um, too long ago biotechnology just wasn't a thing you couldn't do a degree in biotechnology and now it is everywhere it's always existed but it's become a hot area yeah, a very hot area i agree but we noticed before there was quite a few business um, mm. and commerce students here. And so I guess we want to take a minute before we finish up just to tell you that there's this whole other side of biotechnology around the business and the commercialization and the economics and the commerce of, of the bio and the bioeconomy and biotechnology industry. So anywhere that we're thinking about making money, there's a whole business side of it. 
And this is important because when we think about how long it takes to get through from the research that we do to develop um, products and then commercialize them through manufacturing and marketing, um, the types of skills and knowledge that we need to go through that whole process does change. So you now a lot of the stuff that we do, for example, here at the University of Queensland and the research that we do needs a real a depth of, of scientific knowledge about molecular biology, chemistry and biochemistry. But as we move towards actually making that good or that service mm -hmm. and selling it on the market, that type of knowledge is still important, but we also need to think about all of the business skills and knowledge that we need. So now we start to need accountants, lawyers, business managers, marketing people, regulatory guidance. And so business knowledge, um, commerce knowledge and skills become really important as well. So across this industry, we have such a range of skills that um, are needed. And, and this also translates quite clearly into the different types mm. of jobs that you can do yeah. out of biotech. I think the skills that you need as a biotechnologist is not just science. That's obviously very, very important. But you do need to have an appreciation and a knowledge of that pathway forward. So when you learn biotechnology as a subject, you learn the skills for science for sure. That's your strongest skill set. But you layer on top a smartness about how to take that cool idea that you have and turn it into something and what that process is. So you may learn a little bit about intellectual property. You won't be a patent attorney necessarily, but you'll know enough to interface with the patent attorneys and know the right questions to ask. And similarly with regulatory and other areas. Yeah. So now that we've told you all about how great biotechnology is and how it's such a fundamental part of science that's going to change the world. We'd like to invite you to redo that word cloud that we did before um, and see how your understanding um, has changed over the past 45 minutes as we've been mm. speaking. So if you wouldn't mind jumping back on um, your smartphones or there's the uh, link to Menti up there with the code, um, tell us now what you think biotechnology is and we'll see if the word cloud has changed <laughs> oh it's got more words Hopefully more words and then we can start taking questions mm. Extremely really relevant. relevant. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's very good. We could just that that just sums that, it yeah, up. <laughs> Futuristic for sure. I think it is the future. I think it is a way that we can solve many of the issues that exist in our world today. Sustainability, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Serving mankind, yep. Diverse, that's a very good one. I wonder how many people realized how diverse it was before they listened to this talk. Yeah, I've definitely seen different words come mm -hmm. through now. This is really interesting. Sustainability, that's really good. Give you a few more minutes and then we'll um maybe hand back over to mm -hmm. Amit for questions. More products. Yeah. Commercialization. Serving mankind. <laughs> That's a good one. Better environment. A gift for mankind, I love that. <laughs> That's in the chat. Genetics. Key to health, yep. Technology. Amazing, I like that. <laughs> Living. 
Technology is oh. not moving. It's really center still. It it's fantastic. Yep. So Amit, would you like us to stop sharing the screen and we go to questions or how would we like to run this? Uh, we I can be on the screen. I do not mind at all. I think it is uh, coming up with some very relevant terms. Uh, mm -hmm. And I really see that uh, the, the way this uh, word map initially was, uh, it has changed quite a bit from there, right? Uh, some yeah, really good terms so. coming up now. It was a fantastic uh, presentation, uh, you know, the, it was very knowledge packed, so many different areas of biotechnology covered. I did not even know that biotechnology is so relevant to all the parts of the world that we live in. Yeah. Brewing Pretty as cool. opposed to uh, biotechnology, that was my best one. <laughs> 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 all right, but then, uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lissette and Professor Avril. I think uh, that Pleasure. was a wonderful session. Uh, lots of learning, lots of exposure there. Uh, it was uh, brilliantly delivered, and I hope the students found it very relevant too. Uh, I see that they've been engaged throughout, so uh, I'm assuming that they are very happy with the way the presentation has been delivered as well. Uh, making the world a better place. Uh, I, I jotted down some notes while I was uh, listening to you. So making the world a better place. Uh, removing chemicals, removing harmful, uh, you know, substances from the environment, cosmetics, clothing, uh, I don't know, less pollutants, so many good uh, things that can be achieved uh, through biotechnology. Lots of career options as well, uh, since, uh, you know, the, uh, the way uh, this space is evolving, uh, a lot of need for new skills and uh, younger generation uh, to come up and contribute to the space and make the world a better place to live in. So uh, there are many questions for you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, put the questions across and uh, you know, I would request you to choose uh, who would like to answer. Uh, okay. The first question is uh, from Nandini. She asks, are these smart watches and smart inha inhalers used for medical treatments safe and the biotechnology used in the devices, uh, does that affect any of our body or body systems adversely? Well, one thing we, re we are really lucky about in the biotechnology space is a lot of these goods and services and products are regulated. And so we have national regulators, therapeutic good, re good regulators that will review safety data from a lot of these, um, well, the drugs, but also the medical devices mm -hmm. to, to ensure that these devices are doing what the company says that they're doing it and they're doing it reliably mm. and safely. So that's why I mentioned the Apple Watch mm. because um, so Apple um, ran a few clinical trials, I believe, to show how the okay. watch um, was working um, in terms of the echocardio function. Mm. And then they had to submit that data to the FDA for review before mm. they were able to have it registered or cleared as a medical device. So. Um, that's one way we're lucky in this industry. I think one of the things you would look for in any new device is one that has been approved by a regulator rather than something off the shelf. So do your homework, I would say, because anyone can create the technology and sell it. You need to look for ones that have been approved by a regulatory mm -hmm. body because that means you've looked at it very carefully and that it will be okay for you. Yeah. There are also laws about, well, in Australia, definitely, mm -hmm. there are laws about making a therapeutic claim about a product or a process mm -hmm. that um, can't be supported. And um, our regulator here, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, they will actually fine companies if they make mm -hmm. claims about a product that does something mm -hmm. for some sort of therapeutic benefit when it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So we're lucky that we do have the regulation in this, mm -hmm. in this industry. I'm going to take that question about uh, making soil fair biochemicals. So one of the things they do in agriculture is not so much to change the soil, it's to change the plant, to make it more resistant to, say, drought conditions or make it more resistant to disease. And there's a, a wonderful lady here. She's, she's Indian, actually, and she came um, across to Australia and she, she was very um, growing up was very disturbed by the lack of food many people have in India in her home country. And so one of the things she was very keen to do was to make better plants. And she started off by looking at genetically modified plants and she made she did outstanding work and made some outstanding plants. 
that absolutely did the job. They were genetically modified, they were resistant to disease, and she took those to the regulators and they went, we don't want genetically modified plants, thank you. So what really was remarkable about her was her tenacity and her drive to keep going. And so because she saw the problem with the genetically modified with avocado at the time, said, okay, well, what about if I just genetically modify the root system and not the plant itself? Is that okay? So she made plants of that nature. And again, they were resistant to disease. She could prove there was nothing genetically modified about the fruits that came off the plant. But still, the Australian regulatory body said, no, we don't want that because it's still a genetically modified plant. So again, she reinvented herself. And rather than genetically modifying the plant, she sprayed her technology on the leaves of the plant and it still worked. So the plant was the same as it always was, but she could use the same technology, but spray it on the plants, which was wonderful, except it was expensive because it degraded very readily in the sun and the heat and the water. And if you're a farmer, you don't want to spray something on your plants that will cost you a fortune because you're trying to make a profit out of your fields. So she, again, fourth time round, reinvented herself and she came up with a new product. So she incorporated this technology into a bio clay. And that clay protected this technology from light, from heat, from rain. You could spray it on the plants. It's very cheap. It lasts a long time. And she, because it's, it's in that shady gray area between genetic modification, but it's not because the plant is the same as it always was. And the technology does degrade naturally to natural things over time. So she has actually changed the regulations in Australia so that her product can be used. It's not genetically modifying the plant, even though the technology is very similar. So she is one of my most admired people here at the <laughs> University of Queensland, because she has an amazing story to tell and you should look her up, because she's incredible. <laughs> so a lot of it is to do with modifying the plant to resist disease and therefore thrive in certain environments. Um, can we make people immortal by biotechnology? I would say not yet. We know how to make cells immortal. Cancer cells are a type of immortal cells. So ultimately, maybe we could, but I'm not sure I want to live forever because I reckon there'll still be diseases that will get you. There's Quality of life is something that's important. But there is lots of research into mm -hmm. aging there and um, senes cell senescence and you know, what's the, the biomolecular basis of aging? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's a topic of the next X-Men yes. film. There's, there's a bit in the field that I work in called inflammaging because they reckon that inflammation is quite key to the aging process. Mm. So if we can get on top of inflammation, we may have less disease and live longer and healthier. Here's hoping. Here's hoping. <laughs> Maybe my- <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, Lisa, the there is, yeah, there's one question here, uh, which I think uh, might be a good one to take up. Uh, how sure. do you balance the commercial and the ethical aspect of biotech? We always hear yes. about large pharmaceutical companies in increased price of drugs to generate profit. How is that regulated? And do you think there is more we can do to mitigate this? Uh, that's by yeah. Anushka. That's a yeah, good thanks. question. That's Thanks, awesome. Anushka. It is a really good question. Um, there's a lot of research and a lot of commentary about drug prices and is it ethical to charge those types of prices? Mm. Um, one thing we do have to keep in mind, and I'm, I don't want to necessarily, it, the, the process of developing mm. or inventing a new drug and then going through clinical trials and getting it to market, that can take 10 five, 10 years and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And so there needs to be, I think, some sort of incentive for companies to invest that kind of time and money in developing a new drug, because otherwise with no, um, I guess, return on that investment was the incentive for putting that money in, particularly because it's such a risky process. Mm -hmm. So there's many statistics around there, but one of the, I guess, more common ones is that for every one new drug that's launched on the market, there's at least a one, 100, sometimes even more 
drugs that have failed and every one of those failed clinical trials. So there's been something wrong with them. They don't work the way they think they work. They don't work at all. There's something about safety issues, which means that they can't ever be used in the human body. And so if these companies have invested, say, $100 million for 100 drugs, but only one of them actually gets to the market, um, it's, a lot of, it's, a, it's a lot of expense yes, for little is. reward. Um, however, I mean, we're quite lucky here in Australia mm -hmm. that drug prices, even though they can be expensive, our government covers some of those price, those, those costs for us. So there are other ways around um, trying to make those drugs, these expensive drugs, more widely available to people who can't afford them. Mm -hmm. um, the generic drug industry is an interesting one as well mm -hmm. because um, a lot of these, these companies can charge huge amounts for these drugs because they have patents or in market exclusivity periods, which means that legally no one else can make that same drug. But once that um, patent period and market exclusivity period finish, other developers, generic drug developers, can go and make copies of that drug. And that's one way that the price then does mm -hmm. come down because suddenly there's two drugs on the market that do the same thing. If one of them's cheaper, it's a bit of a no-brainer which one yeah. you buy. Yeah. And actually, the um, a lot of really great generic drug manufacturers, I believe, in India. That it's a really big huge. area. And then now we're starting to see the same thing happening in the biologic drug space. Mm. So we're seeing um, biosimilars come to the market. And again, there's lots of biosimilar manufacturers in India. But yes, it's, an in, it's a very interesting question and it's it's been debated for years and I don't know what the final answer would be. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think there is a good answer. And I think it, it's quite hard when you are um, not well off and in a country that is, is impoverished and you can't get access to treatments that the world definitely has. So yeah, I, I certainly don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> but it is a it will be an ongoing debate the world over. And one of the things that will impact certainly the biologic space is how the, as the manufacturing improves mm. and the prices come down because the manufacturing gets better and, and India is certainly all across manufacture. So, you know, there's, there's a bright future, I hope. And yeah, we'll hopefully keep, you benefit from that. And we'll just keep fighting for change, change mm. for the good. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Professor Avril and Dr. Lizette. On that manufacturing piece, uh, also we have a question. Uh, do you think the idea of biotech helping the environment could make us complacent when it comes to environmental conservation, right? And uh, the other related question is, when do you think these biotechnology uh, you know, products would come within the reach of common man, right? So there are two questions. Uh, one is uh, whether uh, this could make us complacent uh, in terms of conserving the envi uh, environmental conservation. So, so say for example, uh, the use of plastic, now replacing that with something uh, which is more biodegradable or use of biotechnology to create uh, some other substance that can replace plastic, would that uh, actually take us away from the major problem of not having plastic use at all, right? So that's one part. And the second is how cost-friendly, how pocket-friendly can these technologies be uh, so that they can be within the reach of a common man? Good These question. are really deep questions. Well I, done, everyone. I would, I, would, us. <laughs> I would take the second question first because I find it very easy to answer. Um, if you go back to the biofuel example, um, certainly there's a lot of that here, looking at algae and growing algae. And we take our students out <clears throat> to an algae farm, which is close to Brisbane. And this professor, his whole point is to make it low tech, make it affordable so that people in the third world, they can dig a pit as long as they have water. There is no electricity on the site and they can grow algae. And that algae can be a food stuff. It can be a, a food for their animals. It could be a fuel. It also creates um, nutritious oils. So they're very good for you. So that one, it can even be cosmetics, he's turning it into cosmetics and pasta and all sorts of things. But it can, one quite simple technology that is cheap can spawn many different industries. So it's not that all of the biotechnologies you come across are expensive, some are not, some are very cheap and very innovative. And that's where the real money is. If you can create something that's very cheap, and create different products and different, even different companies he's producing out of that one really cheap 
readily available resource that that is the holy grail i think mm. so that's what we see a lot in biotech is one technology whatever it is spawning many things and the limit really is your imagination mm. in terms of the plastics though that's a hard one i hate plastic <laughs> absolutely hate it <laughs> i'm a chemist and i hate plastic <laughs> um and i think the good thing is that if we have new plastics that can biodegrade in a reasonable time frame, and that's something that is important, they need to live long enough to do their job, but not long enough to damage the environment. That would be right. a good thing. Mm -hmm. And we can use those without being worried about it because they do degrade. So whether that makes you complacent, only if you're still using old plastics. And I, I would hope that we wouldn't become complacent yeah. because the whole driver with developing these new technologies is to help the world become more sustainable and yeah. um, more environmentally friendly. Yeah. So that's, and we've been, you know, for millennia now, we've always been striving for to be better and to develop yeah. and do things better. So I don't, I would hope we wouldn't become complacent. <laughs> well, I would say and then you look back, I think we were more complacent in the past when we were blinded to what plastics were doing to the world. And I think the new generation of students and my son being of a similar age to most of the people on this call, you're acutely aware of what we have done, as in the old people on this call, to the planet. And you are there making change. And I think that's really exciting. And I think that is a, a tremendous force that will continue forwards. You will teach your children and hopefully your children will benefit from what you do. And so I don't see complacency in the future. I see hope. That's a very powerful message, uh, Professor Avril. I think uh, that's the message that we would all like to give our children. Uh, I've got a three-year-old daughter and that's the message I would like to pass on to her when she grows up. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lizette and Professor Avril. I think it's been a brilliant session. I still see a lot of questions, uh, but we are running out of time. Uh, I apologize to all the participants. We can't take uh, all the questions at the moment, uh, but I'm going to leave my email ID in the chat box. So if there are any questions that we were not able to answer here, and Professor Avril, uh, and get back to you. Uh, yeah. uh, over to you, Dr. Lisette and Professor Avril, for some uh, final words to our students today. Good luck for the future. I hope you found this talk really enlightening and um, look forward to seeing where you as scientists and how you'll change the world in your scientific careers. Yeah, and I hope that you enjoy whatever it is you choose to do, whether it's in biotech or in other aspects of life and go ahead and make the world a better place because that's what we all need. Good luck in your endeavors forwards. Thank you, Dr. Lizette, Professor Avril. Uh, very excited, very glad that we had you today here. And uh, it was a very power packed session, lots of knowledge, uh, very powerful messages at the end uh, from both of you. Uh, thank you so much, all the students. Uh, we wish you all the best and uh, uh, may you become scientists and contribute uh, in the <laughs> realm of biotechnology to make the world a better place. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. Thank you, Professor Avril. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye now. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I wanted to run a small poll, uh, Professor Avril, if you would like uh, yeah. to stay for a moment. Uh, sorry. I'd love I to. Very curious. Yeah. One second. Uh, students, uh, there is a second poll on your screen right now. Uh, could you please participate in the polling and let us know if you think uh, that science can help bring positive change in the world? Okay, so uh, uh, the first question, are you planning to pursue higher education and it, at an international destination? So uh, to your delight, Dr. Lissette and uh, Professor Avril, some of these students might just end up at, at UQ studying under you uh, and trying to make awesome. uh, more bright careers. Come and say hello. Uh, so <laughs> And uh, the second one, uh, 94, 95 percent students think that uh, science can help bring positive change in the world. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lisette and Professor Avril. Uh, once again, I think our session has been uh, brilliantly successful that way. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much and for coming to everyone who's attended. Thank you. Take care. Have a great day. Bye now. All right, students. Thank you. Bye-bye.
All right, students, let's move on to the second part of today's session. Uh, it was a very powerful presentation by uh, Dr. Lisette and Professor Avril. Uh, I think we all learned quite a bit from there. Uh, there, there were a lot of eye-opening messages there uh, for me as well. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of fields uh, where I did not know biotechnology was so important. Uh, and uh, that scientists in that realm are trying to make the world a better place uh, through uh, changing the world, you know, removing pollutants and making a difference uh, to our lives. Uh, let's move on to the second part. Uh, we will now move on to understand the importance of English language in our lives. Uh, does it play an important role in our academic and professional careers? And is it a future skill required to succeed in a fast-paced competitive international world? And the most important part being, how do you provide credible proof of your English language ability to academic and professional recruiters across the world? Let me introduce you to Richard Simpson. He is a PT Academics Regional Development Manager with special responsibility for the UK. Uh, and uh, Richard has worked in English language teaching and testing for over 20 years, including 10 years as a teacher and manager with the British Council across Asia, Europe, and Africa. Uh, welcome today, uh, Richard. Very glad to have you in the session today. And uh, we look forward to a very informative and very powerful uh, session from you as well. Over to you. Thank, thank you, Amit, and thanks everyone for your time. I think it'll be uh, hard to uh, to match Dr. Lizette and Professor Avril after hearing about beer brewing through to immortality, but but we'll try. Let me um, let me share my screen, and we can have a look at uh, my slides. And okay, so right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Richard. Uh, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about uh, English language testing and PT academic, and about English languages as a truly global language. Uh, there are 121.27 billion people who speak English in the world. Uh, in India alone, there are 125 million people at least who speak English. Uh, I think the the most populous nation uh, of English speakers is the United States. After the United States, it's India. Um, it is, you know, uh, the ironically, the lingua franca. It's the global the global language. Um, it's a key skill um, for all aspects of life. So that's for academic your pursuit, um, which I, I, I guess everybody here is, is interested in um, for studying either um, in India or internationally. Uh, English is often the, the language which is used. It's a language used to express and to share across different um, cultures. Um, it's the language which is useful for, for travel. And also it's often the, the professional um, and the business language. It's the language of the internet. Um, which is for business and entertainment, and it is a, a global community. Um, so learning English can be a subject, but it's also a key skill, uh, like being able to ride a bike, being able to write, um, being able to swim. It's something which enables you to do something. And we understand that one of the key things is being able to learn English and being able to demonstrate that you can speak English to a certain extent. Um, and that really is about um, being able to, to demonstrate to a university, to an institution, that your level of English um, is at a standard that it can be um, believed so that it will not be a problem, will not be a barrier to your studying. So it's reaching a certain threshold and then being able to study, uh, being able to study in any subject in English medium. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and about different assessment. Because I'm going to talk, and I, I'm part of Pearson um, with Amit, uh, but I work on um, our PT academic. And PT academic is our fast and safe English test. Um, my job is to help potential test takers um, take our test and use the results of their test as evidence to be able to travel to a, um, a university in the UK, in the US, 
in Canada, Australia. So in the US, there are a million people, international students studying. In the UK, there are nearly half a million. Uh, there are 600,000 in, in Australia and about 100,000 in Canada. There are a lot of people traveling the world, um, studying in foreign countries, and English is the key skill that enables them to do that. So just looking at PT Academic, um, there are a whole range of tests available to people. PT Academic is a computer-based test. It's not online, it's offline, but it's delivered and the candidate takes the test on a computer. And that use of technology um, as a delivery method and as a, how we assess, how we evaluate your English is one of the key elements of PT Academic. And it makes sure that it's unbiased. It's an impartial test, that it's secure, and that it means it's a, a genuine proof of your ability for university, for professional and for migration applications. So what I'm going to go through is um, where you can go with your PT academic. So I'm going to tell you about who recognizes, who accepts our test, so, you know, why, why you should take it and who will let, um, accept it. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, technology and about the test structure and about your test results as well, what they look like and, and how you can understand those results. So who recognizes that this test? Uh, well, it's recognized around the world. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, it's recognized by all the universities, 100% of the universities uh, and TAFE Institute. It can be used for all visas and it can be used for professional um, recognition, say, in healthcare. There are a growing number of universities across um, Southeast Asia and East Asia. So in, in Malaysia and Singapore in Southeast Asia, uh, it's recognized by universities and uh, by government authorities. In the UK, we're recognized by 98% of universities. Um, and we're also recognized for visas. So they can be used for a um, study visa for programs below degree level. They're recognized in Sweden and Finland and Ireland, um, in Norway, Germany, France, a growing number across uh, Europe as different countries start to deliver programs in English. Um, they are accepting our test. Uh, in Canada, we're recognized by 90% of the universities. And in the United States, we're recognized by over a thousand institutions, including Harvard Business School and, and Yale. And the number in the US is our fastest growing recognition market. Uh, it's always worth looking and checking our website. If you have a specific university, um, you can see on our, universe, on our website whether we're accepted and what, are the, um, what is the required score. Oops. And we're also, and this is a key um, piece of information to, to consider, we're recognized as a, um, for different scholarships, and that's very important if you're considering studying in North America, especially in the US, where there are considerable tuition fees, but there are a, um, a whole range of scholarships and bursaries available. In the UK, we're also recognized for um, some of the scholarships, including the Chevening Scholarship, and then also scholarships and bursaries available at individual institutions, such as the University of Warwick, uh, University of Glasgow, King's College in London, and the University of Manchester. Again, it's worth, worth reviewing uh, the website where you can find out more information about this. And so I'll just move that. You can see at pearsonpt.com you can always find this information. So there are, there are a range of English language tests available. So, you know, why, why you might think, well, what, you know, why use PT, why choose PTE? What makes it different? Well, we are more convenient than other tests. Rather than taking your test over two sessions, so coming and taking your, paper, your listening, reading and writing, and then having to come back on a different day for a spoken test. Everything in PTE 
happens in one session, one three hour session at our secure test center. You can book your test today. You can take the test tomorrow and you can get your results very quickly. Um, the average is 48 hours waiting time. Last year, it was 28 hours. So you can book your test today, take it tomorrow, you'll get your results the day after. We're a very, very fast test. Now, I mentioned technology earlier, the use of computers um, in the marking of your test, of what you've written, your output, means that it's impartial and it's accurate. Uh, compute, using the use of technology means that, um, and computers means there's a, there is no bias. And we've carried out some research looking across the different leading test uh, providers. And PT Academic is the most accurate test. We have something called the smallest standard error of measurement. That means that we're the closest at able to show your true ability. We're also quite, you know, we're very relevant. Um, all the questions, the tasks you have to do within PT Academic, they're authentic. They're taken from academic situations. Uh, you may have to listen to a lecture and write a summary, look at a graph and describe it. These are reflecting the same things you'll have to do when you are a student. It's the same language demand. And there's a lot of security. Uh, this means that you can have confidence in the results. It means that institutions have confidence in the results and that they will trust you when you approach them with your PT academic scores. So who are our test takers? They range in ages, so from 16 up to more than 60. Uh, the average age is 29. More interestingly, there's, it's across 180 nationalities uh, took our test last year with 117 different first languages. The leading nationality is Indian. 18% um, of our uh, test takers, this is taken from last year, um, spoke Mandarin, and they come from a variety of backgrounds, students, migrants, professionals, and for taking the test for a whole range of reasons, to progress into higher education, for work purposes, or for migration purposes. And that's because PT Academic can help you with visas for all of those purposes. Now, this is about our use of technology. As I just said, we, we test a whole range of diverse people, uh, but we use technology to make sure that we're testing those people in all those different countries in exactly the same way. If you take the test in a, on a Monday in Mumbai or Friday in London, the test will assess you in exactly the same way and make exactly the same judgment. And that is not always the case with tests. So the rate reliability of human raters. A student can give an answer, an interviewer can say, ah, that's, that's an average answer. That student could give the same answer to a different interviewer who may think that is a fantastic answer. And that means the results are not always reliable. Different people perceive things differently, whether they mean to or not, and it's very difficult when you're testing people in different countries, different days, different locations. However, we use machines. So we've trained these machines and that machine will say, okay, here's your answer, student one. The machine will say, that answer is equivalent to a five. The a second student in a different country at a different time, a different day can give the same answer and the machine will again say, hey, that, that answer is a five. They won't think any different. Now, you, you may think, how, how on earth do you train a machine to assess people and to assess speaking in particular? To do that, we spent a lot of time field testing. We gave these machines more than 400,000 examples of spoken English from over 10,000 people. And they, those 10,000 people were from over 100 countries. 
So our test is an international English test. It's people who speak English in India, in China, in Bangladesh, in Indonesia, and in the UK and the US and Canada. So we fed all of those examples of spoken English into the machine and we trained the machine. This is what a five is. This is what a four is, a six. We, we gave them the criteria. And that machine then follows the rules much better than a human would. The machine doesn't get tired. It's not thinking about its dinner. It doesn't care what you look like, what clothes you're wearing. It doesn't, um, it doesn't make a judgment because of your name uh, or because of your accent. It just evaluates your English output. Right, let's have a look at the test format. So you know, what are you actually doing? The test format is one, one session and it's three hours. Before the test starts, you can provide a uh, introduction, a recorded introduction, which we don't evaluate, we don't assess. We just give you the opportunity to do that because we'll share that with the university. So if you want to explain why you're taking an English test, if it's say, I want to study uh, biotechnology, then Dr. Lizette, Professor Avril would be able to, to listen to that when they look at your test results. Then you'll speak, uh, take um, part one, which is speaking and writing. So they're, they're combined. Um, and that will take between 77 and 93 minutes. This is followed by a reading section. And again, it, there's a range in time. And this depends on the number of questions uh, and how long it takes you to complete the questions. And that will take between 32 minutes and 41. Then if you, if you wish, you can take a 10 minute break. And then there's the listening section. And that's again, 45 to 57 minutes. Now, the key thing to remember compared to other tests, within PT Academic, um, there are 20, different types of questions and of those 20 different types of questions 13 are integrated and that means that you're listening and um, reading or you're reading and writing or you're speaking um, and reading and that reflects what you do in real life you don't just listen you often will listen for a purpose so that you can write something and in that way these integrated tasks are more authentic. Okay, so where can you take the test? Um, we have uh, over 190 locations worldwide. So locations, you know, different cities. We're in 117 countries. There are approximately 400 test centers. And those test centers are open between, up to six days a week running multiple sessions a day so there's a lot of availability within india alone we're in 22 cities and there are 38 test centers you can always find the locations by going onto our website which again is uh, pearsonpte.com you'll find as this screenshot shows uh, the location of the test centers and the the fee the test fee you can find the availability in three short steps you get here and then you click on book now select five test centers and it'll show you when the next test session is available let's have a look at the scores and the results and understanding those results so this is what we generate for you we don't issue certificates. You don't get a paper certificate with PT Academic. We're, we're digital uh, and we keep things online. And that means that it's more secure because certificates can be modified, but also it's faster. It's faster to deliver to you and it's faster to deliver to the institution or to the, the authority that you're wishing to demonstrate your English ability. And we call these school reports. So this is a, an example of a test taker school report. There will be a picture of that person. At the top, you can see this school report code. That's a unique code for that person and for their results. I'll come back to that in a minute. There's the test taker ID, and then there's the information about that test taker. You see the, the, the date of birth, 
their citizenship, where they, uh, their country, of where, where they're living, gender, their email address, their registration ID, which again is important. And then information about where they, when they took the test, so the date, uh, the country, um, and if they've taken the test before. And then the report issue date. So when were the results issued and how long are they valid? Our results are valid for two years. After two years, if you haven't done anything, we think potentially, you know, maybe the results have changed or your ability will have changed. The key information, the overall score. So that score comes on a scale from 10 to 90. This person scored 61. And you can see the graph at the bottom. It gives the score of the listening, reading, speaking and writing. And this is, again, is broken down onto that scale from 10 to 90. So for this person, uh, she scored 55 in listening, 63 writing, 65 speaking, and 62 reading. Okay, and that then is combined and her overall score is 61. And that's useful to see. So this candidate, she knows that her weakest skill is listening, but her strength is speaking. We also provide the enabling skills and that's to give you this isn't used to generate your overall score. It's not reviewed by uh, universities in admissions to decide whether to ex accept you or not, but it's to give you some more information and maybe to think about potentially where you can improve or focus on in the future. So for the, this test taker, her area of weakness was pronunciation. So it's just to, to give you some more information. Now, this, will, this result will be generated, this score report is generated within uh, 48 hours of taking the test. When you receive this, you can then share it with universities that you want to apply to. Some test providers limit it to just five universities. For us, you can share that with as many as you want. So that's thousands of institutions. You can assign your results to an institution through your account. That means when you receive the results, so will the university. So if you want to study at the University of Queensland, um, if you want to study biotechnology, then you could assign your results to the University of Queen Queensland before you take the test or after you've taken the test. It's your choice. And when you receive the results, so will they. To do that, you do that when you're registering or within your account. Um, and that shares your registration ID with the university, and they can use that in order to check your results. Alternatively, you can email the um, admissions team at your chosen university, so uh, the University of Queensland maybe, or if you want to study in the UK, Manchester, um, Liverpool, University of York, and you can send them your score report code. Using the score report code, the university can search for you and they'll be able to find your results through their account. So it's important that you allow the university to be able to find your results. They will access our system so that they can verify your results. And when they're looking at those results, they'll be checking against how they align to the CEFR. So in the UK, maybe they're making sure you've got a B2 on the CFR scale. You can also compare those results against um, TOEFL or IELTS, and they'll be looking at the score. As I said, our score is given on the global scale of English, which runs from 10 to 90, and that's a very granular score. So what do people say about us? And that's important for maybe making your decision. And for those people who have taken our test, one of the main reasons for choosing the test is because it's fast, uh, the fast results. You, you, when you're applying for university, you'll often leave the um, English test till the end because it's, the, you know, it's not the key thing. The key, your, your key activity is to identify your degree or pro post-grad program and the university or the country and the city and the university where you wish to study. Then think about your uh, English test. You, as I said earlier, from registration through to result, 
It's possible to do that with PT Academic in four days. So within four days of registering, your results will be with your chosen universities. Also, um, the most, the second uh, top reason is the unbiased results. And that's because we don't have, um, well, technology drives the assessment of people's English who take our test. We have a team of human markers who check the machines and sample tests to make sure the assessment judgments are correct. But we use machines because they're more reliable and they're more accurate and they're very fast. The other reasons are then we, so we're getting more closer to, well, um, similar scoring. And that's that you can take the test in one session. It's far more convenient. Um, you can use a computer to take the test. So during the time uh, disruption with COVID, there's less contact with people. Um, it's very safe. We make sure that all of our secure test centers are applying by the rules and the regulations to make sure that uh, COVID secure. And it's all fully automated and scored by a computer. Uh, we have frequent test date availability across India, across those 22 um, cities in the 38 test centers. There are multiple test sessions every day, ranging from all times of day. So it's convenient for you. Institutions, they like it because it's very clear that school reports are very clear and they're very fast. So when a, a, a university, they maybe they offer you a provide a conditional offer and they'll say, hey, you need to take an English test so we can issue a CAS so you can get a visa so you can come and study go and take PTE because we're much, much quicker. And for test takers, uh, these three test takers have said they, you know, they like us because we're, we're recognized by universities around the world, that it's, quite, it's, less, it's practical um, and it's less stressful, um, less stressful having to speak and be interviewed by another person. You're just producing your English that's evaluated in an unbiased manner and that it's achieved, it's recognized by uh, the organizations that people want it. So that's a quick run through of PT Academic. Um, now, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Richard. That was a great presentation. Thank you for sharing all that knowledge. I hope it comes in useful for uh, the participants today. Uh, uh, Richard, we have a question. Uh, Anshul Ankush is asking, is PT result valid for two years for academic purposes and three years for immigration purposes? Is that right? That is correct, yes. Yes. Two years for academic. I mean, some universities will, will consider for longer, but the, um, we, we say two years for academic, three years for immigration. Okay. Uh, there are uh, no more questions from the audience, but uh, there are one or two questions that I've been hearing from uh, a lot of students who have participated, uh, you know, in our previous sessions. Uh, one is, uh, is PD accepted for Canada, uh, you know, uh, Canada studies? So Richard, uh, anything that you would like to say on that? Yes, it is. It is accepted and it's accepted by 90% of Canadian uh, universities. Uh, you can find an up-to-date list, which we, we update monthly and publish. Uh, at the, uh, the website is updated fortnightly of all the universities which accept PTE. So, yeah, if you want to study in Canada and take, um, take advantage of the post-study work opportunities within Canada, you can use PT Academic for that. Uh, thank you, Richard. A small bit of addition there. So uh, from India, uh, if you are applying in the general st st uh, student route, so non-SDS category, uh, that is where PD is accepted. Uh, for SDS category, we are not accepted right now, uh, but we have a lot of visa success stories uh, from the market uh, in which students have applied with PD scores uh, through the non-SDS route, and they've had successful visas. So you can apply to Canadian institutions using uh, PTE scores. Okay, uh, there is one other thing that, uh, Richard, if you could speak about the concordance report, about the new scores uh, that were uh, given out in comparison to the IELTS bands, uh, and how do they affect our test takers at the moment? Sure. Um, so every, 
every now and then we have a research team who are constantly reviewing and looking at tests. Um, and we, we spent the last two years looking at how the PT academic scale compares with IELTS. And both tests are, um, they're not static, they're constantly moving, they're constantly being tweaked. So they have to be realigned. We've had a, real, a realignment for the majority of people here, uh, for the majority of people who take the test, there's minimal or no difference. Um, the Where people take the test, take PT academic, um, where you need to demonstrate your English for study and migration purposes, it's more in the middle of a scale, not at the, at the two ends, so at the very bottom or at the very top. And for in the middle, so uh, the the area where judgments are made for study, uh, I think we changed our grades by by one point, one out of out of ninety. We have made changes at the bottom end of the scale, where um, we moved sort of further, further. It was almost further down, but for people who are using PT academic for study or for migration migration period um, purposes that makes no difference. And at the top, again, it makes no difference. So it's affecting how PT aligns with IELTS band four or IELTS band nine. It doesn't affect for um, potential applicants to a university. So if you want to study at the University of Queensland, it doesn't make any difference. Thank you, Richard, very appropriate answer. Uh, so just, uh, you know, just to end the uh, webinar with this, uh, you know, a little bit of knowledge about the confidence, uh, you know, that I would like to uh, bring on board as well. So <clears throat> as a responsible body, examination body, uh, just like Richard, Richard mentioned, uh, we did a comparison uh, study where uh, we measured our scores against the IELTS bands. Now, <clears throat> these scores uh, have this uh, new concordance study has also been submitted to higher education institutions and border agencies across the world. And uh, slowly and steadily, you would start seeing uh, their websites updated with the score requirements uh, that you can submit your visa applications with. At the moment, it does not change your life at all. So um, for the actual score requirements of a university or a border agency, uh, it is always recommended to refer to their website and, uh, you know, uh, apply your uh, applications accordingly, you know, achieve that desired score. Uh, once again, uh, Richard, thank you so much for taking out the time. Uh, it was a great presentation, lots of uh, learnings there. Uh, and I hope our students really found it useful today. Uh, any, any final words from you, Richard, before we wrap up the session today? I think, well, um, well, thank you and thanks for your time. I I really enjoyed hearing about biotechnology and I wish I was a biotechnologist now. Um, uh, really interesting things. I think for the for PT academic and for any English language study, if you're going to take a test, the key thing is to prepare. We have a lot of free materials and free online courses available on our website that you can use and they are useful for all manner of tests. It's worth, if you want to improve your score, if you want to make sure, well, evaluate your score, go onto our website and look at the preparation pages. So pearsonpte.com, under preparation, there are free courses that you can do in short bite-sized pieces, and they'll give you a great idea about what to expect in a test. By knowing what you're going to face, you will undoubtedly do better and you do as well as you can. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you, students, for participating today. Uh, today marks the end of our academic uh, bootcamp changemakers program. You are the changemakers. Uh, so prepare well, appear in the PD examination, score well, and pursue your uh, uh, study abroad journeys. All the best to you for a successful future. Uh, we are going to end the session today, uh, but we promise to come back to you with more such learning and exciting sessions in the future. Please stay glued to our Facebook India page, uh, Pearson India Facebook page, uh, my LinkedIn page, Richard's LinkedIn page. We are all over the place when we organize learning sessions. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye.